This is Jennifer Walden, and you are listening to the A Sound Effect Podcast. Bradley Cooper's Maestro is in the running for a 2024 Best Sound Oscar. So last week, I talked about sound editing on the film with Richard King and Jason Reuter. This week, I'm talking about the mix with re-recording mixers Tom Ozanik and Dean Zapancic at Warner Brothers Post-Production Creative Services in Burbank. In addition to Maestro, Tom and Dean have another shot at the 2024 Best Sound Oscar for their mix on The Creator, directed by Gareth Edwards. Bradley Cooper's Maestro is a reunion of sorts for Tom, Dean, and Jason Reuter. All three had worked with Bradley on A Star is Born, which also featured music recorded live on set. Tom, who mixed music and dialogue, talks about carefully creating the right space for the live performances, using different reverbs to change perspectives, to match what we hear to what we see. He and Dean discuss their combined approach to mixing the party crowds, and Dean talks about mixing Foley to match different eras in the film. Mixing the effects is a way to score specific scenes, like Leonard and Felicia's argument during the Thanksgiving Day parade in New York City, and much more. General Hospital by Hal and sound designer Raphael Sohir is a comprehensive library of hospital sound effects. <laughs> Campfire, Fireplace and Stove by Vadi Sound Library is a toolkit of fire, wood burning, flames and different fire ambiences recorded indoors and outdoors. Imaginary Birds by Nicola Tito was made with bird calls, musical instruments, voice and whistling techniques. No actual birds were consulted. Alien Life by Boom Library gives you the tools to develop unique alien vocalizations and bioacoustics for all sentient beings in your universe. Ambisonic Horse Carriage by Stereotype Sounds features ambisonic recordings of a two-horse carriage. Hi, Tom. Hello. Hi, Dean. Hello. Thank you so much for talking about your mix on Maestro. So I had the opportunity to talk with Richard King and Jason Reuter about the sound editing. And one thing we talked about was recording the music live on set. So I'd love to hear about your approach to mixing those music scenes, uh, particularly Ely Cathedral. Yeah, so obviously you heard from Jason that that whole setup was live. And so basically a company comes in who, you know, Jason hired and worked with to mic it all up and record it live as they're basically laying it down, recording it. They do kind of a balance of the elements and lay it out into a whole bunch of 5.1 stems so because it's live and it's all in this one big cavernous room there's tons of bleed of all of the elements onto the other elements but i think i had like 20 5.1 stems so there's stuff focused more over the strings over the brass over the choir in some cases there might be a couple of sets uh like the choir and then you have the two soloists um basically that's what i end up with is these 20 or so 5.1 stems and then you know i try to fit that into the movie and sort of the story that's unfolding there um there's a, a big one master shot where the camera comes over the orchestra and goes right up to lenny and then eventually comes back and lands over felicia's shoulder as we did that movement i wanted things to feel like they were in the space in the real location that they were relative to what we're seeing 
that would not be set that way in what they captured because they're just capturing it in a static setting. And obviously there's a movement to all of that. And we also wanted to let you sort of focus on a couple of the elements as we go by or look at those things, like say the choir, you know, in the beginning, the male choir kind of has a big part that jumps out. And prior to that, they're behind us and then they're in front of us. So stuff like that, I'm trying to do really stealth moves where things just appear in the right place. And in a case like that, I'm really pushing the dynamics of that to get more out of it. So things appear in the place we're expecting to hear them based on what we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you kind of like dial into, say, you know, we come across one point, the timpani player doing a role. And so there's just a subtle move there to focus you on noticing what he's playing right there. And that happens with different people, different players, but it's never a solo thing or a featured thing where it pops way out of the mix. It's just subtleties to make you dial into that and notice it without noticing that there was any change. Yeah. And that must have been so tough, given that, as you said, there's bleed on the tracks. So the mics are stationary and the instruments aren't isolated. So as the camera swings around, now you have to adjust to that new visual perspective using a fixed recording. Yeah, well, sometimes the brass may have a bunch of strings on it that when you go move the strings, they don't want to move because there's enough of them in other mics. So there is a bit of that. But again, it's not intended to be a drastic move that you are really thinking or aware of any of the moves. Yeah. Well, your brain registers where you're flying over, which is great. Yeah. I mean, I always think of sound as a focus pulling device amongst other things. So it can really cause you to notice things in the frame. And so by doing little shifts like that and highlighting something subtly, you're thinking about it or you're aware of that thing without us being heavy handed telling you to think about it. And what about some of the more intimate performances like Leonard's piano duo with Aaron Copeland? So in my chat with Richard and Jason, uh, we talked about how a better version <laughs> of the performance was being edited to picture there. So from a mixed perspective, what did it take to make that work so that you believe that what you're hearing is also what you're seeing? It's really, I think it's a matter of putting it in the space in such a believable way that you don't question it. It just feels real. You know what I mean? If it feels real, you'll buy it. You'll just sort of sign off and you'll disengage the part of your brain that's questioning whether or not they're really playing it or whatever. Yeah. I think in that particular thing, you're watching them play it. And so you do think about that. But the piano is not played just sort of like in front of us straight up in sort of a stereo manner or something. It's pushed a little bit off to the right because the piano itself is sitting off to the right in the frame and then it's played in that room. And so there's room and stuff on it. That's all clues to tell you like that thing is physically sitting right there and I'm looking through this you know, window at the scene. You know, I don't think that's a very tricky, big, difficult thing, but it's, you know, this whole mix is really about elegance and nuance and a thousand different little subtle things that make it feel tangible and real and, you know, just flow together. So I don't think there's any point in the mix where you question the reality of any scene. Yeah, you believe it all. It's so great. You do believe it, right? And and honestly, from the guy sitting next to Tom, I believe all the space. I know what he's doing, but I believe the rooms, the reverb, i.e. the room that he puts on that piano in that particular scene fits that room so you don't question. It doesn't sound fake. And uh, none of the reverbs or rooms to me in this movie sound manufactured. A great, I think, example is the very beginning of the movie. The piano is playing and it comes up over the logo and stuff. So we have no context of reality tied to a picture because there's no picture yet. But as soon as we cut to the picture of Lenny sitting there playing the piano in the open of the movie, 
all of a sudden the piano focuses and plays like it's sitting right there in that room. And prior to that moment, it's played in a more typical, scory, sort of abstract way. And how did you make it feel less abstract and more real for when we transition into actually seeing him playing the piano? Yeah, I mean, basically everything about it changes. It it positionally changes, it changes in space, you know, in the room, reverb, and uh, a little bit of an EQ shift. And then the other factor is that, you know, some of the sounds of the room, you know, start to come in there too. So there's a couple places where something like that happens in the movie and and it's shifting to a, a believable, viable, real space. Yeah, like when he's playing Here Comes the Bride, yeah, and he's actually in a different room playing the piano, right. and you hear it coming out of that room and into this room. Again, you just believe that he's sitting there and playing that. Right, and that's just, it's doing a similar thing where when it starts playing, it's kind of like, where is that coming from? Right. We're kind of with Felicia where it's like, oh, what, what, wait, what's going on? Yeah. And then we reverse and look at him playing and boom, the piano is attached to the piano. <laughs> so it feels like it's right there. So were there any particularly helpful reverbs that you use? Like what helped these performances to feel real in the context of the scene? Uh, I mean, it's all kind of the standard tools that I use on every movie. (laughs) It's mostly Altiverb and Liquid Sonics reverbs like the Cinematic Rooms. The Ely Cathedral, there's so much room in the actual recording that that is just what it is. There's nothing added to that. You know, at the end of the piece of music, when the orchestra stops and you hear this long tail out of reverb, that's the actual Ely Cathedral. That's what's on mic. Wow, that's fantastic. What a beautiful sounding space. Yeah. And then what about the singing in the film? There's that scene near the beginning. It's a party scene, a man and a woman, they're singing together. Right. Was that a pre-record or was that also recorded live on set? Yeah, that's live also. You know, um, that's basically just production, like as if they were talking. I mean, that was tricky in that they're both singing there and they're bleeding onto each other. There's a bit of a, a challenge to sort of contain some of the peaky parts and yet let it feel like it's naturally breathing. And there's a few spots in there where they're kind of peaky and edgy and kind of hurt, you know, if they're not contained. And then, you know, there's a few places where somebody turns their head or whatever, and they really go off mic and um, trying to find ways to um, feel that shift, but not as dramatically as what you know, what gets recorded is way too dramatic, you know, if they like go way off mic and you're kind of going, well, what happened? And so that's sometimes a matter of having to lean on another mic that's either the other person or uh, another mic in the room to pick that up or process it and gain it up to uh, to be at the right level and and not be overly roomy. So speaking of dialogue bleed, Dean, in my conversation with Richard King, he talked about how they got great crowd sounds for the parties that, in fact, Bradley Cooper staged a party on set and Steve Morrow mic'd up all the guests. So you had all these discrete channels of the party goers conversations and you could peek in and out of them to follow the camera through the room. So can you talk about mixing those crowds? Well, two separate things. Tom handled all the uh, on-camera and the group ADR, all the on-camera dialogue that you hear, because Tom did dialogue and music, which was part of Richard's domain because of dialogue editing by uh, Richard's dialogue editor, Tony Martinez. And then our part, sound effects-wise, was uh, crowd effects, party crowds that we circled around and filled out the space to help dialogue and or group ADR, not to feel like group ADR. (laughs) party ADR. So yeah, it was kind of a combo. But as far as all the on camera microphones, that's Tom's department. Yeah, I mean, it all, yeah, it all starts with dialogue. Yeah, we usually kind of establish what is our focus, which obviously is generally the principal actors. I'll go through and try to shape that and get that to read properly. And then we start building the rest of the world around it. Um, 
in the case of the party scenes like that, there's production crowds but but the trick with that is that a lot of it has bleed of the principal actors on it and so it's a matter of a bob and weave to make sure you can use pieces of that some of it's clean because people are far enough away but if they're close to the principals then sometimes i can't really use that because it's gonna have the principal actors and they'll be like off mic and roomy and kind of not really helpful helping. So then we'll add in the group and all of the effects crowds around that. And it's really a matter of trying to keep it real sounding. And with the group, it's potentially the least believable part of it if it's not done properly. And so the effects crowds really help to create a a world and a bed for all that to sit in. And then the group can kind of give you some of the depth. So we have people that are closer to us and people that are further away from us. And it can kind of play against each other. And again, it's just a matter of us sitting there combing through it, you know, multiple times to decide the proper ebb and flow of all that. In each room of that party in particular has a different feel, which was orchestrated. Lenny's room is always busy and alive, and Felicia's room is more subdued. And what about the Foley sounds for those party scenes? Was that something that was challenging to mix in because the crowd was so lively? Yeah, well, yeah, Foley's tricky in its own right, because if it's not performed by the artist's properly and that the sounds aren't true it's hard to mix them in but then again if the sounds are good and the foley was performed great it's a delicate balance to mix it into the scene because either if it's underplayed you can't hear it if it's overplayed it sounds like foley and it takes you out of the scene we had great foley on this show and it's like anything else foley and group adr kind of work hand in hand if you gotta use it and mix it against the dialogue and mix it properly to sit in there to make everything believable and in that particular scene i love the foley because all the movement and the footsteps and all what you would hear at a party fits so well into that scene that you believe that you don't know what's foley and what's really production it must have been so chaotic was there like a lot of foley tracks to cover all of that because gosh there's so many people and like they have drinks and you know they're all moving around Uh, yeah it's probably pretty average for a feature the foley wasn't super wide but in general foley can tend to get wide and this movie was a challenge in a way because the whole movie was 100 percent foley like all movies but we found early on we did three temps on this movie During the first temp, we had to stay true to the era through 50 years. And Foley was used back in 1943, but it was used differently in 1943 than it is in 2023. So we had to be very careful not to overplay scenes in 43 and the 50s in order to make the illusion that we're actually watching a movie from 1943 in that black and white sections. That was a matter of sitting with Richard, Tom, and I on the stage, and then obviously working with Bradley to pick and choose what we needed to hear and what you don't want to hear in order to make those eras believable. So as we went through the eras and then we hit the color 70s and 80s, all of a sudden now more Foley's been played, more complicated. But the challenge Foley-wise in the black and white was to make it all sound believable to the era. Like today, If you pay attention to a Foley track, the person three levels back in the scene, you you delicately hear the Foley. In 1943, that wasn't the case. So we really had to make sure that we didn't take the viewer out of the movie. And we're mixing a movie in 2023, but we had to mix the eras. Another thing that Richard talked about were the sound effects in the sections where there was no music. So the effects were musical in their scope and feel to kind of keep the musical feeling of the film going. Uh, Richard said they used a lot of winds in a musical way and birds and like other natural sounds. So can you talk about your approach to mixing those more ambient sounds to keep the tone and the mood of the scene going in the absence of music? Right. The, The whole track is musical. Everything about the track has a rhythm to it by design between Richard and Bradley and us. Winds, they're a very big part of this movie from delicate, nice pastoral type winds when their relationship is nice and growing and they fall in love to more tumultuous winds as their relationship starts to falter 
and uh, the textures of the winds were very important. It's a very emotional thing when you're mixing winds. It's how it makes me feel how I'm going to play it. No pun intended, but you're just kind of riding the wind as the scene is emotionally telling you how to mix it. There's like a wave and a flow to it (laughs) that is a lot like orchestra playing. How things swell and dive out and come back and change between the different parts. In many ways, you know, this is all over the movie and the movie is designed to be symphonic, the whole thing, not just the music, because it has this flow to it and this grace and this lyrical way of moving. And even in the great iconic scene of the argument, the one shot scene in their Dakota apartment, even how the crowds outside that scene, those Thanksgiving crowds, they're ebbing and flowing as the argument is building. And there's a rhythm to that argument, too, if you listen to the dialogue. The way they're speaking the dialogue is very rhythmic. And so once in a while, you'll hear a, a bleed of marching band go by or uh, the crowd will cheer. But that's all very much designed in a rhythm to the scene because life outside is going on while this argument is happening. Yeah. And the sound of their kid yelling through the door like, well, you know, what are you doing in there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, those interruptions, they have a really musical feel to them. And that's the yeah, that's the theme of the whole movie. <laughs> So for you, what stands out about the sound of Maestro? Like, why should it win the Oscar for Best Sound? This mix and this sound of this movie is all about elegance and it's about sophistication. It's not about being bombastic. It's not about hitting you over the head with anything. It's about precision and the musical flow of the entire thing. So it's really a very delicate, nuanced thing. And I, I, that's what I hope people can recognize is it's not a matter of density. It's not a matter of there's tons of sound or it's not a matter of how hard it is or anything. It's a matter of how precise and it spans these really intimate, delicate scenes all the way to these giant performances like Ely, where it's this massive thing, but it's all a matter of grace and beauty. Yeah. And if it didn't take you out when you're watching it and you believed every frame, then every department did their job. If we didn't do our job well, all those beautiful costumes and that remarkable makeup and those beautiful performances you know, we would have we would have tanked some of it if we didn't stay true, just like all those other departments. Aside from sound, not only did Bradley have to learn to conduct, he had to learn to conduct like Lenny. So there's that really great scene uh, near the end of the film where Leonard is at the university instructing a group of students on how to conduct an orchestra. So every time the kid conducts it, you hear the differences, like it's a little bit different. And then Leonard gets up and conducts and it's definitely different it's really amazing like that the performers and bradley as the conductor were able to create those differences i mean that whole scene is that is all recorded live that's all real you know when it came to the m e it was a problem because the whole music track has dialogue on it because all those players are kind of sitting right there and they're right up on them and so when bradley's talking it's all in the mics of the orchestra Again, there was some little subtle trickery to make sure that there was those noticeable changes and differences to the performance in particular, that it was a little more wowing when Lenny does his part. But yeah, that's all real. That's so awesome. So that was all my questions. Um, Thank you guys so much for doing this interview. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Looking for more audio-related podcasts to listen to? We're part of the Audio Podcast Alliance, featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcasts about sound. Be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org. That's it for this episode. Thanks a lot for listening, and see you next time. Take care. Take care.